Good day, listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio program. We're glad that you've decided to join us. My name is Jonathan, and we have a special guest on the line with us today. We have Carol Jurgensen Sheets, but she is better known as Carol the Coach, right, Carol? That's exactly right. All right. Like to coach people into bettering their lives. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, we are going to uh, we're going to roll up our sleeves in a minute and try to do some coaching of the of these guys out there that are that are going through sexual addiction recovery and and maybe trying to figure out how that um, how they can better learn to serve their wives as they go through that process. But before we do, listeners, we're we're grateful for you because the only way that you're seeing us or hearing us is because we're a listener supported program. So that means that those of you have decided that there's value to what we're doing. You've come alongside and you've partnered by giving and we are grateful for that. If you'd like to learn about all the ways that you can support this ministry, just go to puresexradio.com and click on the donate link. Well, Carol, I want to dive in because you've written a great resource here called Help Her Heal. Um, and it's an empathy workbook for sex addicts to help their partners heal. So I would love for you to just kind of maybe take us sort of from the ground floor. Maybe you're a coach, like take us from the locker room. Like where, how do you help men, first of all, that are dealing with sexual addiction to even get into this conversation about empathy and what that looks like for the process with their partners? Well, I became a certified sexual addictions therapist seven years ago. And, um, I started working with the men and I was talking to them about 10 recovery tools that I knew could really make a difference in their lives. And they started using the tools with a lot of um, regularity and they got better quickly, but their wives didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled their wives in and, and they were just, they were traumatized. They were really hurting. And I tried to help them. I sent them to groups. I talked about things like men of the battle, women of the battle, and just really tried to give them some direction. And they actually would work with some of my therapist friends. And a couple times I heard, she doesn't get me. And so my therapist friends would say, yeah, they didn't think that you got them. And, they, and I would go, me? are you kidding me? I, I hurt for them. I so get their pain. And actually, I um, took that to heart. I, I think we're 100% accountable for our behaviors. And so it mattered to me that there were a few of them that thought I didn't understand. So I went and got some partner-sensitive trauma training so that I could do a better job of letting them know that I understood their pain. Forward a year and a half later, I'm on the board and I am teaching, I got a whole class for the next two weeks, clinicians and coaches, how to do this work. And in the meantime, what I realized as I was helping them is that they really wanted most from their husbands, fidelity and empathy. Mm. And then the men that battled with sexual integrity who were getting better could work on their recovery and be amazing, but they didn't know how to do empathy. And so I started working on exercises for them and brought their wives in and actually did things a whole lot different. You know, if a woman called me to find out about my services for her husband, I made sure she came in first. You know, not first, but with him. I mm -hmm. wanted her to meet me. And I decided I was going to treat the relationship and then help them both in their own journeys. And so when I decided that the men did not know how to do empathy, I realized that they needed a manual. They needed something that could help walk them through that. And that's where I created Help Her Heal, because my belief is he caused the pain, he caused the drama, he caused the trauma, now it's his responsibility to contain the pain while she gets healthier. And then ultimately that makes him feel better. And so that's my whole premise. Yeah. So let's, let's start from the very basics. How would you define empathy? Cause I think sometimes that's a hard word to unpack 
-hmm. So how do you generally try to help men understand, first of all, kind of like empathy 101, what's the definition of empathy? Well, the most basic definition of empathy is being able to understand something and walk in someone else's shoes. You don't necessarily feel sorry for them, which is sympathy, but you have empathy for them and you let them know that you can see their pain and you're feeling it, hearing it, and viewing it. That's empathy. Um, my experience is that women, the number one thing that betrayed partners want to know is that their husband understands and gets their pain. He knows he caused the pain. Mm -hmm. And when he can continuously let her know, I know I did this to you, I made the mistake, I am so sorry, and I'm sitting here with you doing anything I can to make it right, that helps her heal. So that is an empathy technique. Yeah, and would you say that if a, if a husband's recovery is going well, at least on like the behavioral front, like, hey, he's not acting out, he's doing positive, healthy behavior, Mm -hmm. Do you see in your, in your practice a lot that even if all of the recovery is going well, but he does not empathize with his wife, it's as if to her, his recovery isn't really going well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm just asking if that's kind of a perception then that a wife has of like, it, I don't know how much it matters that you're not doing these things anymore because you're still not understanding me. Well, what I see more often than that is that I see that she's happy he's in recovery and he's going to groups and he's reading the Bible and he is journaling and he's praying and meditating and, and calling people in the fellowship and has that connection. But if she doesn't feel the connection, then what we know is that there is a resentment that he caused the pain and he's not connecting with her and yet he's in recovery. Mm -hmm. So that's where the problem lies. She wants to know not only that he's in good recovery, but that he wants to rebuild the connection because she's wondering, am I stupid for staying? Mm. Am I teaching my kids that I can be betrayed like this and, and stay? She is going through a lot of her own shame let alone pain. Mm -hmm. And so she's resentful that he's doing so well and she's still hurting so much. So we have, uh, so it's interesting because, you know, in our ministry, we, we went along kind of a similar discovery pattern way early on when we started the ministry in 2003, we were working with all these men and then these guys are doing quote unquote great in the recovery. And six months later, we get these angry phone calls from their wives. Of like, what have you done to my husband? And we're like, so is he, is he looking at porn still? No. Well, is he having affairs? No. What's the problem? He's kind of worse now than he was before, because I think a lot of times you take away those coping mechanisms. It really exposes a lot of the emotional immaturity. It exposes the other areas of brokenness that what you're talking about here is what they need. And so how do you, where do you start? Because a hundred, I would say virtually 100% of the men that we've seen in our ministry that qualify as sexually addicted are emotionally stunted or emotionally immature. They have a low emotional intelligence quotient. Yeah. Um, low emotional IQ. Yeah. So where, where do you start with them to get them on this path of greater empathy towards their wives? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. And what I do is... I talk to them about her pain mm. and I teach them skills initially that will decrease their defensiveness and let's say their attack mode. And what I mean by that is they're doing better and they expect her to recognize that and cheerlead for it. Mm. And I get that. They're so happy that they're doing well that they want her to be happy. But the truth of the matter is she doesn't really trust it. And she can be mad that he's so happy with his recovery because she's not happy. So I get them to practice some techniques where they don't take 
her anger personal. They realize they caused it, but they also, um, they don't necessarily tell her this. So I'm talking to partners that are probably listening too, but I caught being coated with Teflon. I say, I want you to imagine you're coated with Teflon mm-hmm. and I want her barbs and her insults and her anger to roll off of you and not get inside of you. But I do want you to hear her and I want you to acknowledge that. But don't internalize it. Because what happens to men when they internalize their wife's anger, since they did know that they caused it, they go into shame cycle. Um, I had a man come in today and he said, you know, I just tucked my tail between my legs and walked out of there because I didn't know what to do. Um, So they either retreat or they get angry. Mm -hmm. And they say, when are you going to get better? This has been eight months. I'm better. When are you going to get better? And all of a sudden, they're putting that responsibility on her. And that's so not fair. So they have to coat themselves with Teflon. And then they have to say things to themselves like, I ask them to use a mantra. This is not about me. This is about who I was. This is about my addict. She is angry at that person. And now I got to show up and show her that I can connect with her, that I understand her pain, and I'm willing to contain it. It's interesting. I did this today. I said, I'm willing to contain it um, while she feels. And this guy, who's a Catholic, said to me, oh, that's very biblical. You putting your hands out like that. That's very biblical. And um, I said, yeah, it is. That's exactly right. So I teach men how not to take it personally, to know it's about their past, not their present, and that their main mission is to contain her pain and acknowledge it. And I'm going to tell you something. I I have a principle called AVR. It's an empathy tool. And, And that stands for A, acknowledge her pain or the issue. V, validate the feelings, and I keep it to five, anger, sadness, loneliness, fear, and happiness, and then R, reassure her that that's your past, that you're new, that you're working on yourself, and that you're there for her to get her through this horrible pain that you caused, Mm -hmm. and when they do that, she melts and feels safer, is less defensive, and feels connection. So let me ask you this as guys, because I can, I can imagine uh, a lot of guys latching onto that and going, yes, you've given me something concrete, like even going like AVR, great. I've got like a checklist now. <laughs> I have something. And, and even maybe in the, in, in the workbook too, I know you've got lots of places for guys to write out certain things so that they're kind of preparing. I do know that you've always got to, you got to crawl before you walk. You got to walk before you run, right? Mm-hmm. What does that um, what does that feel like for a lot of wives just to see their husband attempt to crawl? Because I think from a from a man's perspective, a lot of times the I've I've said it many times in our ministry before. I think the most fragile thing on planet Earth is the male ego. <laughs> like mm-hmm. men can be crushed so so quickly. And that's an issue that we have to work on. We have to deal with that. You know, it's like we have to take ownership of that. We can't blame it on anybody else. But I think sometimes guys, when they recognize then, oh my goodness, Carol, the coach is totally nailing me to the wall on my, the fact that I'm an emotionally kind of immature guy. I don't, I don't have the emotional skills yet in order to really, you know, engage this well. I think some guys, even given a great tool like AVR, Mm -hmm. might feel like, oh my goodness, is my is my wife gonna kind of like call me out on the fact that I'm I'm having to have like a cheat sheet here? (laughs) And like, or what what is the typical response though? Because I feel like because maybe this has been so foreign for a wife to get from her husband that the smallest attempt is met with. Finally, like something is changing, but I'd love to hear from your experience and your, your coaching that you've done. What does it feel like for a wife when her husband just begins to try to crawl in this area? Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually heard two questions in that. One is how does it feel for the, the partner, the wife, and then how does it feel for him mm-hmm. who's never done this and is starting at ground zero as an infant to walk? I want to address that first, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, my experience is that men love this stuff. Uh, they may not like to read. And they may not want to do the exercises. For instance, in chapter one, two of the exercises are when I wounded my wife um, or I wounded my wife when. And they have to answer that. And they have to answer that so that they stay cognizant of how they did wound her. And then another exercise is my wife needs blank. And so they have to put themselves in her shoes and decide what does she need. Okay, when they have those kind of exercises, it helps them to develop empathy. They're not connecting with her. They're just thinking about her from their perspective. That's kind of an infant learning how to walk. My partners that I talk with, and I see as many partners as I do addicts, um, they say, my gosh, he's more sensitive. He's not nearly as defensive. I'm actually a bit kinder to him, even though I don't know that I can trust this yet, Carol. And if I trust it, what happens if he can't sustain it? The same issue for his own personal recovery. Oh yeah, he's got 103 days, but what happens if he can't hold on to that? Mm. So I asked them both to be very, very patient and gentle and kind with themselves. And you had referenced something. Um, My first chapter in the book is the hardest on the addict because I'm explaining uh, neurocircuitry of the brain and saying her brain is offline and she is going into fight, flight, or freeze. And she's fighting, it's her amygdala. You're dealing with a brain that's overly activated and helping him understand that it's not just the damage he's done to her, He's also caused trauma. Well, when he gets that, he doesn't take it as personally. It's, he's able to see it better. So it helps to build the emotional IQ, or what I refer to almost in every session, emotional maturity. And I love what you're saying there because everything that I'm hearing you say, it's like there's woven in to empathy a natural softening of disposition towards another person right? Mm Because it's really hard. It's almost like empathy and and anger are sort of mutually exclusive in the sense that I can't get necessarily out of control and abrasive if I'm actually engaging empathy. If I'm trying to think, because you kind of have to get outside of yourself in a way, right? And I think it's such a great exercise because if you think about it, everything about a sexual addiction is pointed toward the addict. Like everything Mm -hmm. is about me and my desires, my wants and everything. And so that naturally creates this frustrated, angry person. Um, And so I I think empathy has so many layers of benefit, not only for the relationship, but also for the person who's exercising empathy, right? Well, and if I can take it one step further, then you have 12 step groups like uh, SAA or SA that were based on Alcoholics Anonymous, basically telling the partner, you stay on your side of the street, you don't have a right to know. Now, I I believe in these groups, but they're they're changing. They used to use the old model of you're a co-addict, you attracted this, now you do your own work, and when you get healthy and when he gets healthy, you come back together. And now we're seeing a shift where they're understanding that this is a relational issue. Mm -hmm. His sex addiction affected him in his recovery and her in the relationship and them. And she has the right to know uh, what he's doing and how he's doing and what he's working on. And that opens up communication and that helps to make her feel safe. And I'm an APSATS therapist, a partner sensitive trauma therapist who helps him to, to give her anything that makes her feel safe. He's not going to have to do it forever, but he might have to do it for two, three, four, or even five years because 
that's how long it takes his brain to heal and her brain to heal. And, you know, obviously in, in a healthy, growing, thriving relationship, um, it, empathy is exercised by both partners in the relationship, right? Right. But I think it's very important what the work that you're doing because a lot of times when recovery gets started, and I would love for you to comment on this, there is just such a mismatch in so many things between a husband and a wife or an addict and the, the one who was traumatized. Um, there's, there's obviously already just the difference between male and female. Um, mm-hmm. There's the difference between emotional maturity. There's the difference between being the offender and the victim. Um, and so why is it important, do you think, that we not try to put on the same plane what empathy looks like in this season between the two partners. In other words, I don't think it's a one-to-one like she needs to be just as empathetic and just as, you know, um, trying to understand him during the season as he is. Now, I'm not saying that there's no opportunity for her to try to understand the process that he's going through, but would you say there's also an imbalance there because there's maybe more work on this front end of recovery that a man needs to do or the addict needs to do in engaging empathy? Yeah, I I would absolutely support that. And, And he caused the infraction, he caused the infidelity, so now it's up to him to help her heal. But also biblically, he's the leader. He's the, the person who is supposed to be taking charge, and he caused the problem. So now I want to give him that power back and teach him skills so that he can lead her back into health. And so there, I, I say in my book, there is a power differential. And before, he had all the power because he was the addict and he was hiding something and it was secret. And now she has more power because she knows that she can leave at any point. And she's not going to put up with this. And I want to bring them back together so they're, they're getting to see each other eye to eye and they are both using empathy. But I, I implore him to do the leadership role and practice the skills 75% more than her and really help her to heal. And to do that, he has to use reflective listening. He has to use focused listening. I don't ever want a couple talking to each other on the couch. I want them to be knees to knees facing each other with them looking at each other's left eye, the window to the soul. You know, I want them to really be attending to each other. And if she doesn't feel like talking during their check-ins, he should at least do that work. And you know, check-ins are so important for couples that um, need to find that safety again. Mm -hmm. So what would you say are the biggest hurdles, challenges, roadblocks for the men that you coach in this area to become more empathetic? What are the things that are just either frustrating for them or they find it very difficult or just really big challenges and hurdles to get over? Mm -hmm. I would say first and foremost, it is that men, you know, addicts will say, Everybody's saying she's codependent, but I'm the codependent one. I'm the one that wants her to be happy again. I'm the one that can't feel good about myself until she is. Um, So I would say that inherent, I know I need to make this right and I don't know what to do. That's why I wrote the book. Um, I also developed a course for men online it's not a live course, but it's a course they can take where I teach them how to do this, give them worksheets, walk them through the process because some men aren't readers. You know, they know the book's easy to read, but they don't have the self-discipline to read. So they like to hear it. They like to see it. They like to see me. They like to hear me talking about what I know is going on in their home. Um, so that's another limitation that can get in their way. And then if they don't practice their principles of recognizing that her anger is about the addict, not about him anymore, um, then they can't get past the hurdle of realizing they can help her heal. That's the biggest struggle. And I've got to tell you, I run empathy awareness groups for men. 
And so they get together and they help each other and they'll go, dude, you should have AVR'd her then. What, what do you mean that you walked out of the room? You need to AVR her. And, and they help each other to stay recognizing that they can get through this. They can't give up. They have to call, call each other when they're mm-hmm. feeling low. They've got a support group and they've got to use it. And that's that empathy fellowship that we're really working on building. I mean, that's why I'm doing the show is I want more men to know how to do empathy because it is a relational skill that they don't have or possess naturally. And then sexual addiction, if they had any, it steals it from them. Yeah. And I would say too, that maybe one of the challenges, I know that it was, uh, it was a real challenge in my own life. We see this in the men a lot of times is so much of the training, if I can put it that way, that comes from a sexual addiction is towards a false image of manhood. What does it actually mean to be a man? And it's, a, it's about power. It's about control. It's about all these types of things. And so I think empathy can feel to somebody who's been trained by sexual addiction, it can feel like weak. It can feel like I'm given in. It can feel, and yet I think what you've probably experienced in, in your work, and I certainly experienced in my own life, and we've had a lot of men experiences, when you really put in the work to learn to become an empathetic man, the, the character it builds, the strength of relationship it builds, there is nothing weak about being an empathetic man. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, I've experienced it in my own marriage and I've seen many other men. It's like, you want to talk about being able to sort of, if I can put it this way, Carol, like turn on your woman, like empathy. (laughs) And I'm not talking about just sexually. I'm not, I'm talking about just like life sort of reemerges in her because it's like now her man knows her, like her man understands her. And there is such, I think, power, not only for the relational dynamic, but even like what your book is talking about, help her heal. Mm -hmm. Like it's part of that healing journey for her, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to give you the closing word. We've got a couple minutes left because I'd love for you to just give any kind of final word of encouragement that you'd want to give to the guys out there that are going, okay, I know that what you're talking about is something that I need to get plugged into so what do I do next? We want them to know how they can get the book. Just where would you, what last word of encouragement would you give to the men out there and where would you direct them to go? Well, um, I definitely think the book is an easy read, but you've got to do the work in it. Mm-hmm. And I would ask each man to find a mentor, a sponsor, or a guide that already possesses that empathy that looks at, the relationship as much as the recovery. That's hard. You know, sex addiction has always been around, but what we know is that it's epidemic and it's changing and we're all pioneers in this field. So I would encourage them to read the book or get the course or find somebody else who demonstrates empathy and you'll see it. You'll see it in your support groups and in your addiction groups and in your churches you'll see men that are empathetic that put themselves in somebody else's shoes i'd have them practice the exercises i'd have them go to apsats that's a p s a t s which is that partner sensitive group they have therapists there that work with sex addicts and partners so that they're going to get this new way of behaving and believing because we really are shifting to looking at this as a relational issue. Mm. Um, And I'd have them read Brene Brown, because she is the empathy expert. There's a great TED Talk, on 10 minutes on what is empathy, just to refresh their memory. And they can listen to my podcasts. I have two, one Sex Help with Carol the Coach, and the other is Betrayal Recovery Radio, that um, helps partners and couples and addicts learn how it feels from the partner's point of view. Yeah. I just, I just sent a guy to your, uh, your podcast this morning. Um, and because he was wanting just some more help and resources on, uh, disclosure. So Mm. probably at some point I want to have you back on to talk, especially about that. But Carol, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Uh, thanks for, uh, writing this book. 
um, men go out and get the book so that you can learn how to better um, empathize with your wife as she's going through this healing process. But Carol, we appreciate you and what you're doing. Thanks for being on the program today. Well, thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah. And listeners, we're always glad that you're with us and uh, we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care. (laughs) 